Hi everyone, welcome to part two of these two videos on singular value decomposition. What we have seen in video one is that the motivation behind singular value decomposition is dimensionality reduction. And we came up with this optimization problem, okay? And if you look at it once more, we see that we have a data point xi that may be high dimensional, it's in lowercase n dimensions. And what we want to do is we want to project this onto a set of R basis functions. So this one is u, uh, uj times xi gives me the, the coefficient in terms of the jth basis vector and then expand it in terms of this basis vector. So this is a rank R expression. Um, so we, re, re, we reduce or restrict our data point to this R dimensional subspace spanned by these R vectors. And the problem is now find the R vectors that minimize this projection error uh, averaged over my entire data set. So it's a data-driven technique to identify a best fit basis to my given data set. And this can also be uh, written in, in much shorter form as the original matrix minus the same data matrix but restricted to the rank R subspace, so spanned by these R singular vectors. We will see that these are singular vectors. And so this is the same objective function. The constraint is that this should be an orthonormal basis, meaning that every of these vectors has unit length and they are orthogonal to one another. So the inner product between ui and uj is one if i equal j, so this is the Kronecker delta, and it's zero if i is not equal to j. Okay, and then we ended the last video with the statement that the famous Eckhart-Young theorem tells us the solution of this problem is uh, simply given by the leading R singular vectors of our data matrix. And so this video is about this singular value decomposition and how these matrices look. We're not going to talk about how to compute it. Um, there's lots of videos on how to do this by, by others and there's a lot of literature in, in, in great books to see how this can be computed. Nowadays, any linear algebra package has commands like this. And we will see in the code and uh, towards the end of the video that a single command which is called SVD will give us the solution. So there's a lot of uh, of more details towards the numerics, but this is nothing we are going to discuss. We want to see the structure behind this. And so this is our data matrix. It is little n by big N, meaning that we have a lowercase n dimensional state space, could be very high, and we have capital N snapshots in time. So this is a time series of a dynamical system. Can also be different data sets like images or so, but since this is a course on dynamic assistance, we are going to consider this as a time series. And what the singular value decomposition tells us is that this matrix X can be decomposed into a product of three matrices of a very specific structure. Right? And so this is a transpose. It has to be a, con a complex conjugate transpose in the complex case, but this is for, for real numbers, this is just a transpose. Um, and so we have this product of a U matrix, a sigma matrix, and a V matrix. And they look as follows, right? So the U matrix is U1, U2, till, right? I'm going to make it a little bit more detailed here to UN, but it goes on UN plus one, till we arrive at U lowercase n, okay? So this is the U matrix, um, and you see it, each vector has dimension lowercase n, and we have n lowercase n columns, so it's an n by n matrix. So this is n times n. Then we have the sigma matrix, which is actually very simple. We have on the diagonal, we have n singular vectors, and everything else here is zero. So we have zeros of the diagonal. And since we have the case that lowercase n, so the dimension of our system is larger than n, this is a matrix uh, of n by m, n by big N. And so since we only have on the diagonal entries in this matrix, everything below the diagonal will be zero. And then we have the third matrix V, which is um, structured very similarly to the U matrix. So we have multiplication with this, multiplication with this, and this gives us the V matrix, 
which is now, um, since we have the transpose, what we get is this is the V1 vector, or the transpose of it. This is the V2 vector until Vn. Okay? And so this is an N by N matrix. And so here we have it, it doesn't look very um, intuitive for now, but we will get there. Um, let's study this in detail and then we will also take a look at code to see what this really means. So a few observations that are really necessary or important, for, at least from my point of view, right? So let's call them observations. What's the first observation? You see, this is a big N matrix, so if I do the multiplication between the U matrix and the sigma matrix, then every row here gets multiplied with a column of the sigma matrix, and you see at big N we stop, right? So this is why I drew this distinction here. Everything that is right of the nth column is multiplied by a zero here. So this part, I can strike it out lightly, right? It does exist, but we don't really need it because it was going to be multiplied by zero anyway. And so this is um, what we call in the notation the U tilde matrix. So it's a smaller version of this. The, the, it's also called the economy version. Right? And you see, since we are multiplying this with zeros anyway, if I took the tilde here, let's just draw it like this, right? Doesn't matter whether I take the U tilde or the U, it will give me the same. Um, and so this is just one thing. So um, the observation one is we can take U tilde because of this, this zero matrix here. And now come the, uh, the observations that are really important for, for the math, okay? So what do we have? We have as our first observation, if I take the U matrix, or U tilde in the same way, and take the transpose with U, or if I take U and take U transposed, then I get the identity matrix in dimension n by n, okay? And so this is very, very important. The first one holds for u tilde as well. The second one does not hold for u tilde because we're cutting something off, but this is maybe not so important here because this one is really what's important to us. What does it mean? It means that I, if I multiply u1 by u1, I get a, a one entry. If I multiply u1 with u2, this is off my diagonal, I get a zero entry. And so this is precisely this condition here. This is, if you wish, the identity matrix for big U times big U, right? So you see, observation one, check, we have found a satisfactory uh, result in terms of our constraint. And now come uh, two observations that are relevant for uh, the, the optimality, okay? So the first one is, these singular values, is what we call them, on the diagonal, are sorted, right? So I have singular value one is greater than or equal to singular value two, greater or equal to the third one, and so on, until the last one, and this is greater than or equal to zero. So they are all non-negative, they are sorted, they could all be equal, but usually we have a strong decay from the first to the next, given that we have structure in the data, we will see this in a second. And so we have a sorted um, row of eigen uh, singular values, and this uh, really carries the importance of these individual vectors, right? And so this leads me to the last um, observation here. If I take my data now and I compute the singular value multiplication, so I reconstruct the x by taking u times sigma times v, and I'm doing this component-wise, you see there's only the diagonal which matters, then what I get is I get exactly this statement that I have sigma one times u one times v one transposed plus sigma two times u two times v two transposed and so on plus sigma n times u n times v n transpose, okay? So this is just, you know, component by component writing out this expansion. And this is really, really interesting here. What we see is that we have a series expansion, n terms, and they are sorted 
because they have this sorting in the singular values. And what we've seen is the u has unit length. Oh, by the way, um, the same holds for the v. So I have v transpose v equal to v, v transpose is also a unit matrix in dimension n by n. Okay, so unit length of u, unit length of v. So the real meaning or the importance is only encoded in the sigmas. And so you see the first one is more important than the second one, which is again more important than the third one, and so on. So we have this, this rank, uh, or the, the, the sorted, this ranking. And if we look at this, what this really means is that we take an outer product, okay? So u1 times v transpose would be something like u1 times v1 transposed means that instead of an inner product, which would give me a scalar, this gives me an outer multiplication. And so what I get really is a big matrix where I have V1, one times U1, V1, two times U1, so these are vectors now, until V1, N times U1. Okay. And so what you see is, this is an expansion of rank one matrices, right? So this one has rank one. Why? Because you see every column is just a multiplication with U1. So this one has, is the same column than this one, uh, modulo a, a different multiplication factor. So we see all columns are basically the same, so it has rank one. So what you see is that our matrix X is reconstructed by a sum of these rank one matrices. Okay, so these are basis vectors and the importance is encoded in the sigma. And so this optimality statement, well, this is not a formal proof, but this is the argument why this works so well. You see, whenever we cut this after R entries, we have the R basis vectors with the R highest singular values, which means these carry the most importance or meaning, right? And so this is really why this is optimal. We can in the end truncate and we do not reconstruct our matrix X um, by all of them, but we have a rank one matrix plus a second rank one. So this is rank two in the end, rank three until rank R. So we have a rank R matrix, which due to the sorting of the singular values will give me the best rank R approximation. And so this is why this problem is solved to optimality. One final comment before we go to the code, the V matrix that I've written here is something that encodes sort of the, the spatial correlation, if you wish, right? This is maybe beyond the scope of this, but just to give you the full detail, the U will give us the spatial uh, coordinates or the, the state space, basis vectors in, in our state space. And then the V will tell us something about the temporal correlation. So how important are these basis vectors in every point in time? So this is sort of a time encoding or the important, relative importance over time, how it changes, it's sort of a time series stamp, if you wish, and this is the, the spatial information. All right, but to, to give you a better overview, maybe let's have a look at this example that we studied in the last video already. Right, we have here the sea surface temperature plot in two different months. And then we saw, okay, well, if you zoom in, you see that this consists of a lot of these dots. So we have roughly 48,000 points in, in our lowercase n, it's a very high dimensional state, and we have 120 snapshots in time, so the big n was 120. And so now let's perform the singular value decomposition and try to find a basis that is tailored to our data set. Okay, instead of considering point by point independently, let's find these, what we call modes in the end. Okay, so here these, these abbreviations, or the, 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 the zoom ins, and here is what we're going to do. Right? This is the singular value decomposition. We are first extracting our, our, our regressor matrix Z, as we have seen in, in the linear system identification. So it's the C surface temperature, and these are the leading 119 snapshots in time. So the big N minus one, and the Z dash is one step ahead. We will need this later on for, for further algorithms, but the Z is for, for now our regressor matrix containing the states at the current time step. And as I told you, um, we, we are not talking about how to compute it, but you see simply uh, U 
and S, which I use for sigma here, and V is simply calculated using the SVD command. And so this is contained in every linear algebra package. In Python you have this, in MATLAB you have this, in R you have this, and it's usually very, very efficient numerically. So you can do SVDs for, for very high dimensional systems. And what I've done here is I have simply computed these and print this, printed the sizes. And you see this has taken 0.4 seconds to do the SVD on such a large dimensional data set on a standard laptop, so it's really fast. And this is what we find. We have already here the economy version of the SVD, which means we calculate the U tilde, because we do not have a 44,000 by 44,000 matrix, we have a 44-ish thousand times 119, so the first big N columns of this matrix. We then have 119 singular values, so this is not the diagonal matrix, but these are just the diagonal entries. And the V matrix is 119 by 119, so big N by big N. And what you can see now is this is the sorting that I introduced here, right? I said sigma 1 is greater than or equal to sigma 2 and so on. And so you see here really, and take care that this is a logarithmic scale. So you see we have a very, very large importance in the first vector, also a very large importance in the second vector, and then it starts to decay. And you can see, even though these are still high values, if you compare them to against one another, these are several orders of magnitude. So the most information is actually contained in the first few vectors. Right? And so this is really the benefit of the SVD, whereas if we looked at the sea surface temperature, every pixel counts, if you wish, because it gives us local information. Here we can take the leading singular vectors, and these allow us, since these now contain global information, right? these are not unit vectors as we had uh, in, the, in the standard Euclidean basis, these are fully populated vectors, so rotated basis vectors. And these really carry the meaning. And since they have unit length, the, the importance is encoded in these singular values. Right? People from statistics also refer to this as the, uh, the principal component analysis, and this encodes sort of the variance in towards this direction. And now let's have a look at a few of these leading eigenvectors, okay? So these are the U, these are the columns of my U matrix now. And so I've colored, since they have the same dimension as my X, I can use them to color the, the Earth again, right? So all my 44,000 pixels. And you see that now these are basis vectors that do not consider a single pixel, but they are global basis vectors. And so you see the U1 uh, has imp information about the mean of the flow. Well, this is not visible here, but you, Hopefully uh, you believe me that the, the leading mode contains the mean information. And so you see this is the average temperature profile of the Earth average over 10 years. And then on, with less importance, you have other patterns, global patterns that are also very important, right? So the U2, you see that we have a lighter color on the southern hemisphere, darker color on the northern hemisphere. So this encodes sort of the, the seasonal change between winter and summer. Right? And so you will see that this will likely oscillate with roughly a frequency of one year to, you know, if you add this to the first one, this would be the average, and you add this one with the temporal correlation denoted in the V matrix, you will have the seasonal change. Right? It's still a very simple system because it's your mean plus seasonal change, but you see we can hierarchically build this up. And then the third one contains patterns that are somewhat more distinct, right? So you see there's in, in the Pacific, there seems to be a patch of cold water, and then in the towards the, the more northern Pacific, we have this heat patch, so this seems to encode dominant temperature patterns in, in the Pacific Ocean. And then you see coastal information and so on. And the fifth one is something we are going to revisit soon, contains information about the El Nino phenomenon. So, you know, large scale temperature changes in the Pacific Ocean. And so you see, this carries a lot more information than just uh, simple points. And we see already from these six first leading singular vectors, we get a very good intuition about the system. And this allows us to reduce the data by a very large deal, right? And we have talked about nonlinear systems here, but similarly, you can also simply use this to reduce linear systems, obviously, right? So we have no, made no assumptions on the data matrix. The temperature is a nonlinear phenomenon, but still, we can use this technique to find linear basis functions that allow us to do a strong reduction. And this concludes our very short video on SVD. As I said, there's lots more uh, available on the internet, but I guess this gives you a rough 
let's say, interpretation of how it works and why this is such a powerful technique. Thank you.